Radiant Team Ban. Hey you guys, welcome to Sivo Season 4. We are in week 3, Dial day 2. Team My ban. name is Prevatitude here alongside with Radiant Ever. Tonight's cast is going to be top 5 going up against Ehug. Team Our first opportunity actually to cast Ehug and hopefully it's an exciting one as we had Radiant Reluctant team Heroes team forfeit to them on Monday and they were our game of choice but this time Radiant the joint Dota ticker is finally correct and I, this is the fastest I think I've seen teams pick in quite some time. Nature's Prophet, Bat Rider, Nyx Assassin, and Clockwork all ban away, leaving heroes like Bristleback and uh, even Visage uh, to go into back. phase two. AA Life Stealer picked up for top five. The response from E Hug in Invoker and Weaver with another Storm ban immediately. So mid and a presumed Radiant off lane for E Hug with a carry pickup at top five and the five roll. So things just evolving at an insane pace proof i'm excited to see that invoker finally made it through the banning stages i think every game we've cast invoker has gotten banned out pretty much every single time so. uh, he gets banned round Dia two but yes he he has gotten banned out quite often yeah so i'm excited to see him picked up uh yeah it seems like they definitely wanted to roll with him too picking him up really quickly first and the, like you said, these teams are ready to go. They're already <laughs> in the second banning phase and have their heroes already banned out. So Naga Siren gets nixed here. Same with Bane, so a couple support heroes there. Stormsphere and Puck taken out, knowing that there is going to be a mid coming up here from top five, so getting those good heroes remaining. out that could do some damage against Invoker. Invoker is one of those heroes that really loves to five stay back and get remaining. all of his spells fired off. And if you have a hero like Puck or Stormsphere that can drag him to the fight Exalt or jump time. on him, then it gets kind of sketchy for Invoker. Absolutely, and speaking of which, in terms of counter picks, I don't see where Naga quite fits into the form formula, but you know Bane Elemental is something Top 5 is worried about. I think the only way I say Naga fits is the net, because it does go through Lifestealer's Rage, but normally, and this is under normal circumstances, he has the ability to still have the support of two of other heroes and can deal a lot of damage regardless of being latched to the floor. So. I think they just don't want to take a chance on the physical net going through, and that's all right, as top five still have the opportunity to pick a mid to respond to Invoker and need to soon unless they want to incur yet another mid banning phase, and there's a lot of options running out, though I don't think Invoker is as effective as he once was. While Puck and Storm provide elements that limit mobility of the team, I still think that top five can have a mobile lineup, even if they were to go someone like Queen of Pain. Razor, I think, would be a decently viable option in stealing a lot of attack damage from someone like Invoker. But basically, anyone that can challenge should be acceptable, even a Dragon Knight at worst. And that is just conceding that you're going to lose the lane, but Radiant still kind of, well, I wouldn't say loon, just uh, lose, uh, excuse me, just kind of go 50-50 and attain farm at the same rate. And I don't think Invoker is one of those heroes that you should be scared about giving farm, but he is someone you need to fear in giving kills to. Kills and experience on top of that. Invoker with experience is pretty scary once you get some of those higher levels and uh, the skills, it gets quite frightening. Um, I, I have to say, though, I do like the Nagi band out and I do like the, uh, the Bane remaining. band out because they're both good counters to that life stealer. And on top of the net, like you Five mentioned, too, if you remaining. sleep when Nyx is raged, he's going to be the only person not sleeping. And that does give your team an Reserve opportunity, time. too, to try and pick him off while everybody else is asleep on the team. So I think they're solid bands from top five. Uh, Weaver, great at getting in and out of the fight, too. I, I still agree with the Storm Spear and Puck pick off, uh, fans out. Uh, Offlane or too. carry roll for Weaver? Yeah. Um, it it's a good question, right? It is a good question. If you put him on the offlane, if he goes up against a Rubik Nakes AA, it, it's a little scary. All you need is detection and he's dead. So maybe try and put some supports with him. I think would be a better option this game. Yeah, I definitely have to agree. I think that they could actually do an aggro try and safe lane him if it comes to it. They just need to find the right equation to lock down a lifestealer, at least uh, some heroes that are capable of challenging. That would come out of quite a few aggressive heroes. I think Marana can be easily one of those aggressive heroes. Windrunner is a great follow-up hero in a try lane, in my opinion. And that so is someone like Visage. So Visage gets picked up for E-Hug. We'll see exactly how it's positioned in the next two picks. But 
a lot of options still and those are the drafts that I tend to favor most is because Weaver's positioning is going to be pivotal but you don't exactly know where he's going just yet uh, it's safe to assume that he's going to be the carry in some facets, but they may yet run him against what is logical. And sometimes we've seen that in SIVO this season thus far, only being three weeks in. Five yeah, it's still pretty in. early in the season. Um, I was going to note to you guys kind of what the scores are of these two he's teams as well. So let me see if I can pull that up real quick. Um, I know they're very close. I believe Ehug is 4-0. and oh, and top five is three and one, Radiant I believe. Team. I'm not quite sure on that. I do know that Ehug is undefeated so far, though. So that's a pretty big feat for them. Obviously, they didn't have such a great run um, going into the Monster Invitational, but it was really good experience for them, and they are dominating in SIVO. And that's kind of the great thing about these smaller uh, tournaments is that you get that practice that you need, and it's a great stepping stone into the competitive scene. Centaur. Not to negate Ten everything you've remaining. just plugged about Sivo, but that is it's second time ever casting a centaur. I like it, I guess, in the perspective that if you manage to catch a weaver in a stun it's or even a time. lift, you can do so much in order to follow it up and maybe not even afford him the opportunity to go ahead and actually rewind any of the damage in which you've inflicted. They have to worry, though, about their positioning against someone who's going to be very active in Invoker, but other than that, it's not a bad option. I think the amount of burst that you deal against the Weaver is pivotal, and therefore Double Edge coming into the equation might damage Centaur a bit, but these heroes for Ehug thus far don't have a lot in order to bring him down, so the burst is justified in that he could easily snuff out a Weaver afforded the right opportunity, even the tri-lane alone, but this means then seconds, that right? we're going to have to see centaur war runner in either mid lane or off lane as Five a result presumably the off yeah i do have to agree with that so potentially waiting for that last pickup to be a mid lane Dyer for top five bang. he's an interesting hero i agree with what you said that he can kind of catch up with weaver and that might help top five to get into it on top of that too life stare sometimes have the has the issue Radiant with getting kind of kited in a game so if you have a centaur too you can use that ultimate and give life Stare that extra move speed that's also great for him to really get in there and make sure heroes can't run from a very well, um, and the double edge too. You have some fairly squishy heroes with Visage and Weaver. At least Ten until they get some remaining. items under their belt, they're going to be fairly squishy. And that double edge can do quite a bit of Five damage earlier on remaining. in the game. Bands come out though. Timbersaw Dyer and Darkseer pick. nixed out of here. I'm not so sure about Darkseer. I, I think that signals both are afraid of what's going to happen Radiant in the off lane, but Centaur understanding that he already is in the off lane uh top five elect then to pick templar assassin who is still a decent mid pick in the pool able to go toe to toe with an invoker early on and not take much damage from spells like cold snap where other heroes might take so much that they would get zoned out of the lane anytime you miss experience in that mid lane it's pivotal but ta also has the afforded Ten option of getting away from ganks because of early on refraction charges negating all forms of damage, though Ehug has a decent roam lineup in the Visage and CM. This has become an extremely popular combo, and I mentioned a Marana earlier, and it does eventually get picked up, and I'm still super intrigued to see how they want to lane this, because they could potentially even roam the supports over with Marana if the Weaver is up against an off lane that he's comfortable in, even if it's a Centaur War Runner. And then, therefore, they could have a very strong, challenging lane, not necessarily need to kill anything, but just kind of hinder Lifestealer's progression and ultimately win out two different lanes at one time. So I like the lineup. I really do. I think it's going to give Ehug a lot of options to get out of fights. If you see that Centaur ultimate come out and you get worried, you can always pop the... Uh... Mirana ultimate, so that gives them the option as well. But the three casters, Mirana, Crystal Maiden, and Visage, I think they're all really Ten solid early and mid-game heroes that it's really going to allow some space for Weaver to continue farming Five up. Um, so I think it's a really interesting pickup. The only thing I am concerned about, though, I could have sworn I turned my phone off. That's really weird. <laughs> only thing I'm kind of concerned. I actually heard you turn your phone off earlier, too. I know. I it's, we it it's weird. Yeah, I don't know oh. what happened. Anyways, we're in this Prepare game now, you guys. Ehug versus top five. Ehug is on the Radiant side. We have I Jiggle Billy playing the Marana. Pandago will be on this Crystal Maiden. Cakes will be playing the Weaver. 
Uh, Ryu Rio Boris will be on the Invoker, and finally, I'm a Sheep Sucks will be on Visage. All right, we have top five already roaming towards the jungle on the safe lane. Life Stealer fly hard carry, and we have whatever AA taking up the five roll, four roll, presumably played by three, two, one is Rubik. He's the only one whose name I haven't yet figured out. It could be wrong or it could be DC, but I am not sure. Shanks off lane, Centaur War Runner one two three is actually Zon 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 on the Templar Assassin mid lane, and it looks like. They're not going to catch anyone out, but it will be a defensive lane with Ob's wards kind of coming forth to spot things through. Shanks on the off lane still kind of seeing maybe if they could have supported. I think they were worried about getting aggressive laned against, and yeah, that's exactly what it was. So they plant the um, sentry there to make sure that they can spot the Ob's. It no longer blocks the camp on the new fix, but it covers a uh, wide array of ground. That is uh, right over by lanes. that pole camp and make sure that they can lock the lane down. But I think they were actually fearing uh, getting pulled against and having a lane. But actually, it's Cakes, as I said, Proof. So, I don't know. I, I, I was right, I guess. Yeah, you were. <laughs> but it, I think he's going to be all right for the most part. As long as he just makes sure his positioning is all right. He should be fine, but it's mostly Rubik that I'm worried. If Rubik's in that lane, it gets very scary for Cakes. Otherwise, I think he'll be all right with just the AA and the Nakes. There's not a whole lot of ways they can really stop him from doing stuff, but Sentry gets laid down right off the bat. Even some uh, Chilling Touch applied to that as well, just to deal some extra damage. So I don't know if Cakes is going to get very much experience in the lane, or even gold for that matter. But I don't expect him to die early on, unless he's just completely careless. He's and he's, he's doing just already. that. He doesn't know there's a sentry ward there. He runs right into it. Luckily, he does get out of there and now knows that there is a sentry. So Kana can play a little bit better and uh, a little bit safer. Shanks got pulled a lot of region earlier Ooh. on this game. So he was expecting a pretty hard game. And yeah. immediately, the smoke gets popped away by whatever. I think he was a bit careless in his movement. And not only that... I don't know if the graphic was actually revealed. CM starts off in the jungle in order to avoid experience coming away from Jiggle Billy, who's going to be the hard carry farm out of the bottom lane. And Moran is a pretty versatile hero in that regard. I think the thing I like so much about this is for all the past three weeks now, I've been really drilling about radiant sides using their jungle to the full effect and already you see the individual experience is going to be matched on these three heroes jiggle billy getting ready to follow this up still has yet to select a particular spell it is going to be arrow and not going to be able to land it just yet on shanks grabs leap as well maybe considered at one point following that up but the lineup wasn't yet there i think had he picked a moment sooner it may have been but look at the teamwork between these two particular supports already a centaur almost down took down an Neighbor actual saber camp lane. initially he's gonna go down this is gonna be first blood for top five very easy kill for them sorry for interrupting you you can't no resume. that is that is acceptable but no i i think both are uh obviously good points to cover because these little things add up very quickly and at the same time you have top five grabbing first blood and effectively catching up to what they're doing but look at how flat-footed their current support set are actually sitting i i just prefer those types of lineups he will go ahead and actually see a pull through here hopefully in just a matter of moments but uh already cm level two headed to level three and we're just two minutes and 40 seconds into the game that's huge yeah, she's done a pretty good job um, jungling, and I, I like that supports now have the option of jungling, not even just Crystal Maiden, but also Sand King, who's able to effectively form the jungle by stacking and using a sandstorm. So really interesting to see how that's kind of changed to where supports have more options now. Since the jungle did get nerfed in terms of like pulling and having that be a really big thing in the game, they're now making it so that supports can go in the jungle too. And it, it helps spread out the experience, which is really great, especially for Jiggle Billy. He's practically been on this bottom lane all by himself, so he's had that experience all to himself. He's getting some decent farm on top of that, sitting at 15, tied with the Nakes as well as the Templar Assassin. Clearly not. Oh 
out, man. You've been oh, doing man. so good lately, too. I know. The last know, time we I cast, know. it didn't happen at all. Uh, I was so proud. I, I was actually reaching for it, and I hit it like three <laughs> times. It didn't work. Um, what I was rambling on about was the fact that this top lane, I don't like the way that they're actually getting things done. Both support, again, still sticking by the lane, and a huge push coming forth, trying to negate it. And they at least pull four creeps away over to the troll camp, but it is only two small trolls left, so it's just delaying the inevitable and getting this lane back here. Templar picks up and bottles an Invis rune, and we'll see how Zanzanzan Zan Zan wants to use that against Ryu. But Ryu, uh, Karma Collected, actually going an interesting build, having a Dole Talisman and Ring of Basilisk. And one thing interesting to note since we've at least started casting is Invoker has been a favorite hero. Um, real quick, CM catching out Rubik on the top, 3 2 1 in a spot of trouble. Fly trying to follow up, cold feet apply to Cakes, Cakes. Able to get away last second with Shikuchi. Fly trying to get some damage and some health back. Pandango in a lot of trouble and goes down. So Fly should get away, presumably, if Invoker elects not to follow it up. Salve is applied and he does not. Phase Boots also attributed to that kill heavily. And no follow up really just yet, except for a sun strike from Invoker out of mid. Ryu actually is able to support from afar, going at Exor built early on, at least five minutes into the game and providing some bite back for the team, not as pivotal as, um, you know, the Weaver kill that they picked up earlier, but that's certainly inching back towards it as Weaver lived on that engagement. CM forced to kind of sacrifice herself, but look at the damage. Fly is laying down on Cakes in this top lane. That was about three autos right there worth of attacks and already pulls him down to about 200 HP. Needs to be careful against the melee hero. Yeah, I think it's deceptive how much damage Lifestealer does. Because, you know, you see a level 4 Lifestealer and it's like, oh, he can't hit that hard. But he does, it hurts. Yes. And now, bottom lane, Shanks does get hit by an arrow. Unfortunately, we're going to have a big soul assumption coming up here shortly. It should kill it, but I think they're waiting to see if they can get someone else to kill. And they do indeed do that. So Invoker lays down the Sunstrike, gets the kill for himself. It's not that important for a Visage to take that kill. So having Invoker land it was a pretty good decision out of them. Um... 2-2 two, two is the score right now. Centaur was just a little too forward. He was all the way over here, and I know he was probably trying to contest the creeping a little bit on this uh, jungle pools and whatnot, but you've got to be careful when you have a Mirana. You've got to make sure you don't get hit by that arrow. Well, not only that, but just beautiful follow-up there. Uh, overextension by Shanks. They're able to recognize it, and actually Ryu now contributing to two kills without moving an inch his gold. Uh, you know, kind of jumping forward. He's going to be able to grab early items. Uh, hopefully, it's a uh, four staff instead of something <laughs> like a Dagon. I'm just going to keep my fingers crossed here that we're not going to see any uh, janky strategies come out tonight. But already they're rolling. Hand of Midas finished up on Marana. Shanks does have Tranquil Boots to his name, but after that one mistake kind of afforded an opportunity for them to get back into this particular uh, bottom lane more so than they were engaged just a minute prior also uh, to note 321 roaming out of his particular lane uh, smoke picked up on crystal maiden and we're gonna see if they can actually grab Ryu they had a slow trap right on and I think he wanted him to pop it but not feeling comfortable enough to take him down next to the tower so uh, Zan 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 elects not to actually go right there with AA uh, coming right back up here. I What is this OBS about? I mean, I guess it marred a monitor's ports. Marana ultimate TP in on mid. Zon, Zon, Zon in a, kind of a spot of trouble with 3-2-1 right there to support him. Three heroes hanging around the middle for E-Hug and nothing yet left to happen with Weaver kind of roaming through trying to take out uh, some of the wards from the look. TA's getting dove on though, but turns it around very easily onto this Invoker. He goes down very effectively. Shanks getting in on the action now as well. They're going to try and chase down Visage. He's dead by all rights. The stomp comes through and barely connects with him. Pandago unable to do anything. Tries to take down this TA, but he's pretty hard to take down with those refractions up. I'm not too sure what that was about. They don't have the tankiest supports in the world, and while Visage can be tanky once he gets his Gravekeeper's Cloak going, Soul Assumption is the more important ability to scale up on that support role. Therefore, you have a great burst Radiance element, but you can't take too much attack. damage before you go down, and it won't be mitigated whatsoever. So Gravekeeper's Cloak, actually the strongest magic resistance in the game, poured in topside cakes. Right on top of Fly, Cold Snap, follow up by Ryu, forces out Rage. He's in a lot of trouble. I imagine he's going to go down. Good Sunstrike placement. Actually nearly takes out Radiance whatever as Infest is popped. This is a double kill if lined up correctly. Cake's actually going to eat the cold feet and not move forward. Instead, Fly forced back onto his tower. 
Forge Spirit there, Rubik rotates over, and that will stave off any further aggression from Ehug, but still, great translation. Don't quite manage to pick up the carry, but they do grab a support for their troubles and try and even things up at three for four, but where they're not doing things uh, well necessarily on trading kills like we saw that Visage over in mid lane they're making up and farm things still relatively even and they actually have the gold graph rising in their favor with the rotation coming back from Ryu as well as I'm a sheep moving back over to mid Ryu's done really good this game he's sitting at 33 which isn't incredibly high in his lane but he did have a few issues with that gank coming his way but he's He's had the map awareness to be able to land these sun strikes and has helped his team secure a couple of these kills that probably would have gotten away otherwise. Shanks just taking those attacks from Marana, dodges the sun strike as well. Probably would have killed him too. Um, it, it would have been quite a bit of damage. So he probably would have gone down, but does manage to dodge it just barely. Um, but yeah, Ray Burroughs, he hasn't had the greatest farm, but I think he's going to be all right. He is nearing that four staff, which is going to help him get into these fights really well. And he's sitting at level eight, which is uh, tied with the top four highest. You know, I, I have to say that Arrow was a beautiful lineup, but uh, more so I like this synergy between this particular E-Hug draft. Two global elements that they provide in Sunstrike as well as the Marana ultimate, neither have really had to been forced to move out of their lane in order to contribute, but as a result, their team is sitting pretty. Pressure will bring down this tier one tower top side. Haystrew picked up on TA to note, and we'll see if they follow that up with the Sunstrike trying to pick off some of the supports, but Fly, all the wiser, moves right next to the Rubik to help absorb some of that damage. As they move away now, mid lane going on and finally expecting the haste. Marana tries to get an ult away and they will trade Rubik in exchange for Invoker, but all the advantage there has to go to top five as TA goes ahead, lives through and grabs that. But in the meantime, Lifestealer gets picked off over by Weaver because of the support rotation away from that top lane. And Weaver has been chomping at the bit to get that completed bottom lane under a lot of pressure of its own, looking to trade towers, fortification expense, two ports forthcoming. Arrow will not connect this time around, so not fo so fortunate was uh, Jiggle Billy, not able to really line things up, but didn't need to, just leaps away to safety, and the tower gets denied, but still a decent gold bump for E-Hug, tying things up at 5-5 with Armlet getting um, completed on the flip side for top five, so a whole lot happening in just the span of a minute there. Yeah, Armlet Face Boots, it definitely gives Nyx some options to get into these fights. Force Staff also finished up Dyer's on Ryu, so he's going to be able attack. to make some things happen with that as well. Uh, but Top 5 is definitely getting the better trades out of these. When you're losing like a Rubik for an Evoker, I mean, that's not something that you really want to trade when you're E-Hug. Um, so i got to try and keep the heroes alive. But I will say that Cakes has done a pretty decent job on the top lane. Considering what he was up against, he only died once. He's gotten some farm out of it. It could be better farm, but considering the lane, I think he did an okay enough job and even secured two kills in the process as well. So I think he's going to have a decent enough mid game. But the question is, can he go up against the snakes who's been farming pretty decently in the top lane, almost uncontested, has 68 um, gold in terms of creep kills rather his net worth is sitting at 4800 though he's not quite at the top but he's very very close to everybody else other than that marana who uh, has had free farm. inflated it, marana is free farm but a little bit inflated you have to remember because of her uh investment into the midas but it's gonna start paying off very quick just 12 minutes into the game 1900 on her person could elect to go much of anything and still be very effective while doing so, it could be anything from a Manta style pickup to, uh, I, so I, I would say Yasha probably first is the best bet, Dyer's but I wouldn't be, I, I don't think it'd be far fetched to say Desolator early on would deal a whole lot of damage. They do have enough frontline elements to kind of try and slow things down in the Crystal Maiden, Visage stuns, uh, Weaver is rather slippery and might uh, deter some focus. Real quick, one, two, three, getting refraction charges burned away, kind of forced to walk off attack. some damage over on middle lane. So Zahn, not in the best of shape as both supports for E-Hug were there to slow him off the lane. Meanwhile, Jiggle trying to chase down AA well behind the tier two with no port response coming out of top five. But um, I, I would definitely say just keep a lookout to what Marana is going. If it's Yasha, I would expect to see a little bit more farm. If it's Desolator, uh, they're going to look to team fight early. I don't know which I like as the better play. Dyer's While Desolator um, provides a lot of damage early on against someone like Centaur, I don't 
realistically know how much she could do. Sheep in a spot of trouble, grave chill to move away, and they will get out as Marana expends the ultimate just to be certain. So uh, I, I guess what do you think about Desolator Dyer's versus Manta? Is under attack. I I like Desolator better. I think since she's been left uh, unchecked on this bottom lane, it's going to give her options for kind of split pushing if she ever has that opportunity to rise. So get it in that does um, great waters against the Nakes, the Centaur, and the TA as well. So I think Desolator would be a better pickup. Yes, Manta will tank her up a little bit more and uh, potentially give her some dodge ability. But I still agree with you that I think that's what's going to be our best pickup. I feel like there needs to be some damage. Yes, you have the uh, Invoker who can do some really decent AoE damage and then Weaver, but it's going to be a little while before Weaver gets going. And I think if you get Desolator picked up, it's going to help that Weaver a lot earlier on. Marana Arrow narrowly misses Zahn. Zahn, recognizing the fact that it was coming, is able to get, even get up refraction charges with Invoker trying to bear down a bit on this mid tower. If it is Desolator, that will open the door now that this tier one is slotted to fall in a matter of moments. So both tier ones down. Desolator providing a much needed armor debuff as well as Visage having Medallion. So they would be able to take Roshan down relatively quick uh, under the 20 minute marker if they elect to do that. And Templar again coming up big, denying another tower. Shanks in a lot of trouble. Sunstrike does connect this time. Good stun follow up, followed up by the actual dual edge and the tower is wow. enough damage to take out Marana. What a turn of events as it looked like just one more hit would have sealed the deal. Courier goes down with Zahn dueling Ryu in the mid lane. Ryu forced to QQ walk away at the cost of an extra 175 for top five who seems to be on the roll at this stage now. And they need to be with the late game shaping up well for E-Hug. Two Midas deep invested on this side. I think it's going to be a really good mid game for top five. With their early lead that they have going on is great. On top of that, you have Templar Assassin, who is presumably going to go ahead and pick up the blink here as the next item. But Ari has face boots. This Ryu actually gets revealed. There goes the reveal. The sentry is laid down. Can they chase him down long enough? They're kind of scared to do so. They have the fire guys here just pounding down on them and know that reinforcements are coming through with this tier one tower in mid still standing there it gets a little risky to go on ryu at this point just because he has four staff the tower is there for any tps to come on through and the ghost walk is um also available to get fired off so i think it's a little riskier but as i was saying back to this ta we're gonna see a lot of movements coming from her pretty soon in this game once that blink dagger is completed i guess she could go with the des desolator first but I would still like to see a Blink Dagger picked up. I don't think it's going to be a right. Dagger because she went Drums instead. It very well could be, but I don't think it's as likely. Centaur blinks in. Shanks locking down Ryu immediately with Fly popping out. Visage trying to deal some damage. AA old follow-up actually is going to whiff everyone. Shanks now in trouble. Good. Visage double sun. Soul Assumption and Weaver enough to finish off, but Cakes is in trouble. Gonna need to rewind maybe some of the damage with Marana ult trying to get him out. A second Soul Assumption coming through. Rewind stolen by 3-2-1 and utilized as Visage is able to port away from that fight. So Sheep able to escape danger. Exchanging one for one. Advantage still going towards top five as a huge damage dealing element was exchanged for an off lane, but that's all off laners need to be. Fly, uh, on the run right now, I was gonna say all off laners need to be is a disruptive force and element, and Fly looks to be getting away from Jiggle, and Jiggle ports out as support was forthcoming in AA, seeing if they were actually running or TPing instead, but TP was the answer there. It might Dyer's just be a Desolator picked up for TA attack. now. It, he has enough for a Blink Dagger at this point, so. That might not be the item of choice. Uh, which Deso you said? Yeah, for TA. Unless you have another. Yeah, item I, I, I I think once you get one movement item, it's not necessary to grab a, a second movement item in the blink dagger. So, I don't think it's justifiable to say uh, go both Dyer's drums and tower. blink because she's gonna need a damage element at this point. No. Uh, drums are indeed a steep investment. Eight seventy five alone for the recipe, and then you have to consider about another. A uh, thousand there uh, for the first pieces. Weaver dangling on the edge there. AA ult again. Narrowly fails to connect and Cakes is able as a result to destroy the tower but not get the last hit. But still that is the first tower that E-Hug has not had denied to them. 
What do you think about the play that we've actually seen even in the past three minutes out of Shanks? He seems to be the everyman right now, just trying to make things happen for his team. And while he's not necessarily dominating on the kill board where his Rubik is four for one, he's two for two. But uh, it seems like everywhere he goes, big things are about to happen. The Nag spawn loaded up, smoke and ult expend misses Ryu this time around, not able to kill. I think it's Shanks' time. It's 18 minutes into this game, and he did finish off that Blink Dagger, too, on top of that being level 11. So he has two forms of initiation. Even the ultimate can be used as a way to get his team away from a sticky situation. So I think it's his time to shine. I don't think you're going to get much out of him if you just continue sticking him in the lane and farming. Obviously, you can't push down towers either. So it's time for him to make some big moves for his team. And if you can do that with TA also, it allows Lifestealer that space to farm in the game. And already Lifestealer has had such a good game, sitting at a net worth of 7,700. So the only reason that the Marana is um, on top of the scoreboard is not only because she's gotten um, complete free farm on this bottom lane, but that Midas as well. So considering both of those, I think Fly is doing pretty good in getting his farm this game. And Jiggle Billy, seeing if he can make things happen, pops the ultimate. Um, and nothing really came from that, unfortunately. <laughs> Six cents kind of tingling there though for Zon 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 actually drops that trap up on top of the hill and it didn't necessarily reveal her until I think the waning moments. It might actually not have revealed her uh, in the end, but just interesting that that would have happened. Ultimate from AA this time will connect. Centaur ultimate to follow up. They try to get a hold, but good leap away only has the shatter combination connect and nothing further. Centaur looking to see if they could potentially snipe another kill and they need to continue on their momentum and not let heroes like Weaver farm. 3-2-1 challenging that fact as he's one-on-one -on -one in Cakes up on top, both trading Shikuchi nukes against one another as that is probably one of the most efficient abilities that we can see Rubik steal this entire game. As a four roll, he's certainly done his job, but you can't say that Sheep has been a slouch either. Three assists deep, trying to make things happen as top five bear down on this tier one to see if they can initiate a fight with Ehug looking like they're interested at least in attempting to respond. Shanks. Nakes bomb up on sheep. Sheep in a lot of trouble. Still not quite going down. Can't bear down the soul assumption before dying. And Fly should get away clean from this one. In the meantime, in the backfield, Jiggle trying to make stuff happen. Seeing if he can lock down. Arrow on cooldown for another six seconds. Gonna see if they can chase as Shanks is in a lot of trouble. Slow up from TA supporting that fact. One second on Arrow doesn't matter. Visage familiars are enough. And sheep still contributing even while being down. Good melt strike though from Zon 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 to actually Radiance pocket another 100G. In the meantime, engagement continues on middle as AA is sniped out by the second Invoker Sunstrike, still participating in the fight as both split away from one another. Zon 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 in a lot of trouble. CM there to try and lock down, holding off on Frostbite for quite some time, but flies there to back up, now turn things around. Jiggle can't do anything to save her. Goes down immediately to Zahn and company, and it's Yasha, not Desolator. SNY also finished up on Fly, so race car life stealer kind of coming out with Cake still trying to participate. This fight is insane, Bru. Yeah, they're going on Fly still. Sunstrike might just hit. Yes, it does. We were there as well to sure that up for them, but now they might just be in some trouble. Jika Lily jumps out of there, but the reinforcements have arrived. Ryu is there. Shanks getting in on the action on top five side of things, and that's when it's uh, the best time to back up for Ehug. Shanks even jumping in once again to see if he can catch anybody out. I was wondering what um, <laughs> Jika Billy was doing there. Jumping in with a leap very offensively, but there was a radiant or rather a dire courier there So he secured the dire courier kill and then used his ultimate to get out of there And then cakes had joined the fight too. So um, it wasn't that terrible of them They took down nakes and didn't lose either of these two core heroes on the nakes or rather on the um, Weaver and the bottom. So a really really one good pickup for them Yeah, one and one on the courier throws I was gonna say. Yeah, it's interesting it's 10 to 10. It's a really even game. And I think a lot of people going into this match watching it were expecting Ehug to completely wipe top five, but top five really hold their own. And I feel like they're kind of a comeback team too. We've seen some games with them where they're down and they just manage to turtle up, get their heroes farmed up and find farm where they really shouldn't be but finding farm. I, I'm still extremely worried I, on the same facet by top five. I think Ehug has done their job. They went Midas and now jumped on. Is Jiggle Billy stun connects double edge to finish it out and three for top five should push and take down the tier one. 
but they invested Midas. It means to me that they were looking to go late and they knew that they had a better late. And if you look at Shanks all, with as active as he's been, he still only has the Blink Dagger and Tranquil Boots. He has an item progressed for a good, what now, maybe eight minutes into this game. So unfortunate for top five, they're not finding the same exact gold opportunities. And you see the gold graph as a result rising towards e-hug because top five hasn't been in my opinion aggressive enough in pressuring down these towers being the better mid game team so i do have some legitimate concerns as a result for what will happen in the late game yeah i think it's going to be interesting to see and e-hug is winning by a little bit you have 41k on the net worth for them um to 33k so they're winning in the gold regard and then experience isn't as big of a gap but they're also winning there so i don't think it's quite an even game but it's definitely close, and I still think that's anybody's game to win. TA does go ahead and pick up that Yasha, though. So no Deso just yet, no Blink Dagger. Um, and I think the Blink Dagger was a pretty bad call on my behalf, because not only does she have the jumpsuit give her mobility, but the Centaur Ultimate 2 would help a lot this game in terms of getting her in there. Well, it's also interesting to note that this... Uh... Cup, I want to say about six to eight months ago was the favorite build for TA. It follows up into a Desolator, and then you kind of get your crit. Uh, you don't necessarily need to finish something like a Manta style unless you're snowballing heavy enough. And real quick, Life Stealer taking out Weaver top lane. Good follow up there from Shanks to expend that ultimate. And while E Hug might have had a good global presence in even heroes like Ryu, uh, contributing to I think four total Sunstrike uh, kill helps at minimum, if not kills. Uh, they're biting back with top five being able to drop down Shanks' ultimate, trying to make things happen every time it's up. And now jumping on top of Ryu, AA ult to follow it up, but it's unnecessary as Zon 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 is able to go ahead and lock down and take out the Invoker. So just really solid play, good movement out of top five right now. They're doing some five man Dota, which is what they need to do for a while with an ultimate getting expelled by Jiggle, who is way in no man's lane, looking for a courier snipe. They recognize it's happening. He's still going for it. The courier stopped moving. And unfortunately they yield it. I don't know why they stopped the juking, but at the same time, there was only one on middle and they had the tower dead to right. So unfortunate, again, turn. For top five, while they garner some advantage, they yield 175 per player towards E-Hug, and the gold woes continue. They try to spike it down towards 5k, but I imagine on the tier two pressure in exchange for Roshan, that it's gonna go up again for E-Hug. That's funny. Jigglebilly's like, all right, well, I can't defend the tower. I can't do anything about that. So I'm just gonna try and sneak in your base casually and kill your courier and succeed in doing so. They do push down the top tier 2 tower while the Roshan goes down, but I gotta say that top 5 is getting a better deal all this. Unless 3 2 1 goes down just from Pandago here, and he does indeed go what down. What did they engage? They knew that there was two top. There's no TP points. They knew that they had this, these two tier 1s down in the bottom and the mid lane. There's. Uh, there's no reason, in my opinion, not to engage there. They had a sentry, they knew Cakes was coming, and now Shanks trying to bite back a little bit against Jiggle. <laughs> Blinks forward, what a juke by the Marana! <laughs> <laughs> doesn't even need to expend leap in order to juke an arrow forthcoming barely misses shanks follow up trying to come from the familiars and one of them gets sniped away as a result yielding 100 gold to fly sunstrike from invoker Ooh, toggle on the armlet just narrowly misses and ryu has been so on with those sun strikes this entire game visage stun up on fly fly toggling for his life right now trying to get back to the base support forthcoming shanks able to jump in but not before marana jumps out and still playing a game of cat and mouse living life on the edge as invoker finally shows up top lane just interesting juke set from Marana. Huge individual plays. Yeah, dude, Jigglebilly's got some moves. Not even kidding. He is not even just getting away with some really clutch leaps, but he's faking leaps too, like we saw in the top lane. And that would have been a really good blink stun out of Shanks had that actually been a leap from Jigglebilly. So really playing some mind games, and he's been really elusive this game so far. He's only died twice, but he's made some uh, havoc happen within the game. He's pushed down the bottom lane completely, pushed down the top lane completely. So he's really just forcing top five to go places. And Shanks once again jumps in, but the leap gets out in time, so no kill gonna come out of uh, that top five. reaction time. It's so good. Ow. It's so it good. Is. Not this time though, Jiggle is out of jukes. Five seconds to leap is gonna go down. All five of top five right on top of her. 
And it's funny to me how Life Stealer used to be one of the favored carries going into the last international, but since the balancing patch that we've seen, we for a long time faded into uh, dual lane Giant's meta where basically it was just two on two in every single lane and we couldn't figure out how to be successful I think with tri lanes now that it's kind of faded back into a tri lane meta more than a dual lane meta I think it's because the focus has gone so much on movement Dying heroes. Movement speed was a large attack. part of that balancing patch I think many of us took for Radiant's granted, but everyone noticed when people's base movements were restricted, you saw boots get nerfed, people weren't as quick, uh, and you had to make different decisions based on your hero choices. Even supports make different boot decisions now. Uh, coming into games because of how much it has been constrained. So I think it's interesting to note because therefore Lifestealer as a carry isn't as effective as he once was. Shanks, Lifestealer Bomb coming forth, catching Ryu as he four staffs away. Again, an instance where they get away but not quite wholly as they are able to get the stun off while the movement away is still being conducted. Marana Arrow seeing if they could catch Rubik. Ooh, catches it last second. And Jiggle not quite able to pick up a kill as one ports right in front of his face and top five signals a retreat but um back to the point on movement don't you agree that it has become one of the biggest parts of the game and heroes like lifesteal are not as effective real quick whatever getting picked off by visage familiars the micro out of uh, sheep has just been unreal but uh, lifestealer just seeming to fade because as you mentioned in the draft he does often get kited and that's become again a huge portion of the game God, I, I can't even make theoretical points right now. Fly going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Cakes. Cakes forcing out Infest, and he should get away just fine. It's the same with someone like Spin, too. He, he gets kited so easily, so it, it's rough for those here. Shanks gets hit by an arrow. He's down for a while, but he's not out. Cakes is going to get killed off here. Time lapse is not available for him. And now I'm a Sheep sucks deep into the enemy base. Shanks jumps in there with a stun. They're going to try and chase down some other heroes here, but decide to call it off instead. They made their defense, took down Cakes, uh, which is a huge defeat for them, as well as the Visage. So... Really interesting back and forth kills going on, but top five is still getting the better end of this. When it's 17 to 12, the Nakes has been just rolling all over everybody at this point, and top five has gotten some really good pickoffs this thick game. They've gotten it on yeah. the Weaver a few times, the Invoker a few times. Jiggle Billy has been elusive, but he has died three times as well, so I feel like top five is getting some really, really decent pickoffs, and that's going to help them out a lot later on. I don't think E-Hug has capitalized on their lead well enough. You see two instances in the gold graph that is now about 5k in favor of E-Hug climbing down towards the even marker as a result of these pickoffs. It uh, keeps kind of spiking as a result of them not doing things like finishing off Roshan, ensuring their farm, taking farm into safer positions like uh, moving the safe lane. Instead, you have Invoker pushing and farming out the bottom lane instead of a carry element with Marana up against three, if not four top, if they get on top of her. Jiggle in a lot of trouble, needs to leap away, fly on the prowl, looking to see if they can pick her up. Moves into the trees, yeah. ultimate forthcoming. Yeah. Going to see if she can just kind of move away. So spots out fly, but not Shanks and company. While the pick on bottom may yet happen, a lot of damage elements coming out of the Necro minions. The Necro minions zapping Zan 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 down to about half health and forcing him to retreat to well means nothing happens there. So interesting jostling for a position, but... Um, I, I have to say, I expected that Jiggle would be in lane farming a lot more than he has been. And while he's progressing Dyer's towards something like, a, uh, a, a, I was going to say uh, MKB, but instead Daedalus is the weapon of choice with Helm of the Dom. Interesting Marana build all around. So no death, so they feel like they have enough in Medallion, I guess, for armor negation. And then the Weaver is going to be the one to death so carry, which is fine because he's more elusive. But at the same time, I, I I don't know. How much do you personally prefer Daedalus over an element like MKB on a Marana? Her damage output is pretty high, so I don't think the crit is really that bad on her. On top of that, she has decent attack speed. Um, so I'm not against it. In terms of an MKB, I, I, I think if it was a different draft for top 5, an MKB might have been the way to go. But there's no one really that's going to... The dodge uh, is going to be great on. So I, I feel like the Daedalus, this game was a better pickup for her. I think it's going to be more useful. All right. I guess I just like the extra damage, but not necessarily stun. Hold that thought as Shanks right now on top. 
tries to initiate, goes down as a result. Fly, recognizing uh, that one was kind of a sinking ship, is able to uh, get away. And the pursuit is forthcoming out of E-Hug, trying to find someone. They shouldn't get anyone. They have an OBS to protect Rubik from uh, what may happen. But really overzealous moment there for Shanks as he tried to jump onto a Tier 2 with all of E-Hug accompanying their team members and not allowing for a single pick to occur. As this game goes later, I really want to give the advantage to E-Hug, though. I think Weaver is going to be really annoying with that Desolator picked up. Um, if he can kind of pressure these towers, it's going to force Top 5 to defend against that. And while you're doing that, it gives Marana some opportunities to push the lane as well. So I think it's going to come down to whether Cakes is going to be able to make it out of these situations alive. If he tries you know, to split push and he dies, it's going to get ugly for E-Hug. But I wanted to, I wanted to say yes to that originally because that was my original notion is that they definitely built for a late game scenario. But now that we're sitting 34 minutes in and we haven't capitalized on situations, you see heroes like Fly progressing at a relatively even rate. TA is in the lead against two heroes that have Midas that you would imagine pays off until the late, but have not yet. They, they've yet to. So take away the Midas, she pretty much is dead even with Lifestealer, except for some minor increase on the attack speed. With Lifestealer also progressing towards huge teamfight items like AC, and if he manages to finish up an Abyssal, there's going to be a huge change in the dynamic of how they occur. Centaur not only lives longer as a result, but they also have an opportunity to lock Weaver down so long as they can get the LS out of his possession. But they do have, indeed, in my opinion, enough single target elements to go ahead, pop the LS, follow up with an Abyssal, and from there on out, it's lights out. And do they really even need the yes. Abyssal? I guess all you really need to do is hoof stomp on a good initiation, and that might change the entire dynamic of a team fight because E-Hug doesn't have as durable of elements, maybe, maybe, as top five. I'm curious in the later parts of the game, though, when we actually see full-on full five-on-five full five man fights. But hold on, Jiggle Billy on the spot of lane gets picked off again. My Another really good solid pick off the top five. And this is what I'm curious about because we've only pretty much seen these small pickoffs in the game. We've never seen a big, huge team fight. And when it comes down to those big team fights, who wins those? And that's what I'm really curious about. I feel like with Invoker, Weaver, and uh, Marana, that's a lot of damage output, and it's pretty decent AoE damage out of that Invoker, too. It, I think it's going to depend on the initiation from top five, in all honesty. If they can get in there with a Nakes Bomb on that uh, Centaur, I think the team fight will go really well for them. But if they can't get that off, I feel like E-Hug will take these fights, but Erosion is going to go down here ever. Yet again, going in favor of top five as they trade Rubik. Will they trade another fly? Kind of lingering around, seeing if he could grab cakes here. The Ellis has popped away as a result of open wounds, trying to connect Shanks. Not yet able to lock down. Invoker Sunstrike doesn't hit. Fly actually gets a decent bash off right now against Cakes, just waiting to pop that rage until the very last second. Shanks now has Hoof Stomp. Can jump forward. Does get the stun off. Can they have enough damage in time? And waiting in the wings the entire time was Visage, but it's not enough. As much as Sheep tries to, you know, propel Cakes to victory, instead he's actually going to yield up maybe two familiars. One familiar so far. There's the second. Uh, goes to whatever, and even the support are getting some love for the side of top five. Midas, uh, which I didn't notice until just now, has been picked up on AA. So their support are looking to take this just as late as the other team is looking to go. Did Rubik have the uh, gem on his person? I'm assuming so, because it looked like Lifestealer was forced to pick it up in the middle of that engagement. I thought I saw I a speck of green on the ground. I don't know. I thought it was on Nakes, but I could be wrong, honestly. I, I can't recall that um, entirely. But the gym helps a lot for Marana's ultimate, for Weaver, for Ghostwalk. It's the beat-all item for this team, honestly. I think it's going to be really great for them. Um, and top five, still, they're getting these really decent pickoffs on the bottom lane, on the top lane, on the Weaver. And I don't know what it is with E-Hug, if they should maybe force out some team fights at this point, or maybe... Try and get some vision up. Honestly, they can't get vision up right now because of that gem. So that's not an option. So I think it's just that they're going to have to play safer. And at this point, they're not. And they're losing some really critical heroes here in the mid part of this game. Trying to see if maybe Ryu is going to get caught out here. Shanks is loaded up. 
They do have that gym on Nakes. I believe it works through that hero as well when he's infested, but Ryo is going to get caught out. AA goes down, but it's not really even going to be needed. Ryo out of this fight for the next 60 seconds. Now is top five's time to make a move as they come bearing down on the mid lane. They have the Aegis still, I believe, in their possession, don't they? On TA? Yep, TA, Aegis, uh, all the signals are good. Look at how decked out TA is, who has just finished up her Daedalus, went Manta, um, already has had Desolator for some time, just basically needs to sell off drums, buy another item later, but once the Aegis expires, just one more item deep before she is slotted out. This is her time to shine. An immense amount of damage being applied to mid tower. Forces out fortification of Ehug, who are trying to group up without an invoker. A very disruptive element in saving towers. Marana Arrow connects the fly. Response now from top five. They come in, ultimate's expense. AA only connects the CM and that's fine as Jiggle is able to get away. Bite back now from Ehug, pushing forward. Zon 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 on the run. Trying to get a lock on him with Cakes and Company, trying to see if they can just start the damage, but both teams back off before anything transpires. And I think they were just kind of waiting for that Marana ultimate uh, to expire on top of uh, having better positioning. There's no rush to get this done. They still have the Aegis a little while longer. Cakes takes a decently huge hit. One, two, three, snipes out the uh, necro minion immediately and not taking any damage due to refraction now ls has popped away can they lock takes one two three pops aegis e-hug still retreating while managing to deal a lot of damage due to the nature of their ranged heroes and how much they can actually output in times of need like this their turn rates are high enough that they can get those attacks away especially on a hero like takes and they manage to defend and top back as a result of the aegis going down I think we're looking at a really late game here. The defense out of both teams has been really great. Top 5 hasn't had their base really pressured too much in the last 10-15 minutes, but Ehug is starting to get that pressure coming down on them, and I think they're defending it well enough. Sure, they lose a few heroes in the process, but I think if they tighten up a little bit more and really get these defenses down, I feel like they can defend up against top 5. And during that fight too, there were a lot of buybacks available. So I think all of Ehug were kind of preparing for that push to come on through and making sure that they could buy back and get in it and continue to fight another day. But so far, this is probably one of the closest games that we've cast so far. And Ehug are trying to defend their undefeated title. And top five is doing a decent job at trying to take that away from them. But this is still game one, guys. So even if top five manages to take this, they still have to defeat him once more. Now in the top lane, Jiggle Billy does get caught out. Leaps away, but it's not going to be enough. They're going to chase him down. Even a leap stolen from three to one just to get into there once again. And Jiggle Billy gets picked off. And again, ever, I can't state it enough, these crucial pickoffs coming from top five. I, I have to say, I think I was correct on the gem. Rubik has it again. Yeah, you probably were. Yeah, okay. I, I just want to make sure I'm not insane. There are some times well, I Well, you I are ramble, insane, but, but you happen yeah, to be yeah, correct, yeah, Some too. days. Some <laughs> days. Ags um, has been such an influential element. Really, the supports are playing such a large role in this game. You see uh, Gem carried on Rubik. Ags finished up on Visage, allowing an extra stun. Right now, Cakes could potentially get picked off. Shanks immediately getting a hoof stomp and just waiting for him to come out of Invis. AA Ultimate does not connect. Courier in a lot of trouble. Cakes looking for the snipe. Manages to trade it, but will he expend his life as a trade? Cakes still trying to get away. Rewind immediately expend, but huge. 782 damage crit. Takes him down. Mega kill streak for Zon Zon Zon. And still just three minutes away from Roshan. And I thought we would see Ehug handily take the late portions of this game, but as time has told us from the onset, is just that the Midas aren't being as influential as I once thought they would be, uh, partially due to Ehug not asserting their force when they had a sizable lead of 7,500 at two instances, almost three instances of the game. But now gold in the favor of top five, Centaur ult expense. They're trying to get on top of the racks. Maybe get a pick off and see if they can finish this one through. Murana, BKB, prior to the fight. Buyback out of Weaver. Will they continue as the familiars tend to get uh, jolted down right now with Zon 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 leading the charge? Half health on the melee racks. BKB expent. Murana, arrow out towards AA. Ooh, God. They ping it out last second, narrowly uh, misses. And Centaur looking to initiate. Shanks focusing out Jiggle. Jiggle goes down. Takes in a lot of trouble. Already half health. No rewind to his name, um, expend just yet. Finally needing to expend it, but Abyssal applied. Good Invoker for Staff forward to try and get him away and manages to rewind now, but Marana is down. Visage almost goes down. 
and the only two heroes snuffed out are a support Rubik and a carry Marana, and Ehug is just not firing as well as top five are on the team fight front. These fights are crazy. Usually we're just used to these slaughterhouse fights, but Ehug and top five are bringing us a new aspect to the game with just these one-on-one -on -one pickoffs, and then it's done. They're like, all right, guys, we got we got some uh, kills under our belt. We're done. Let's just back up now. And I feel like both teams are okay with doing that just because, for one, TA expended that BKB pretty early on, so not having that would have been kind of scary. Secondly, there is a Roche that will be spawning here pretty soon. If you have a hero that completely wipes out, that does give the opportunity for the other team to go ahead and pick that up. So I feel like it's kind of safe for play, but I think it's okay in this regard. You have the Midases that are going to continue getting these heroes even more and more gold. Um, so it, it's interesting that these aren't huge kills in these fights, but I think it's all right how both teams are playing so far. The gold graphs are still very, very even. Only a 3k difference, but uh, we do see top five finally taking the lead on that. They did have Ehug um, over them for the most part of the game in both experience and gold, but now they're starting to pull both of them back on their side. And this could just be getting near the end for Ehug. We've got to see some really good defense coming out of them and no more of those pickoffs. I think it could potentially come out of someone like Invoker. It depends on the spells he's looking to invoke. Uh, like I said, as long as he's not picked, it's going to delay things. But unfortunately for Ehug, they've allowed quite a few picks, and the 10 kills are working well against them, but only to the tune of 2,500 gold. They could stifle uh, the bleeding as best they can and move forward, but someone like Weaver needs to pick up an additional item. 4.1k to his name and still not quite dealing enough damage in these fights. You have someone like Fly, though, who also hasn't really item progressed in the past maybe 10 minutes in that he's had the Abyssal finish but no AC forthcoming. So they really need to make something happen. Maybe Will in a moment here on bottom lane. Cakes is kind of out of his element if they get the Naix Bomb and recognize his TA in the lane, and that's all he was waiting for is the presence of one hero to back up to support from Jiggle Billy. But I, I just think that it could go either way. As close as this game is and as much as it looks like uh, you have top five dominating right now on top of Jiggle Billy, Fly jumps out. Jiggle jumps right into a TA. Wicked six streak. Zon, Zon, Zon there to play safety as uh, Jiggle was trying to worm his way out of another situation, but another prime example of E-Hug just giving away all the wrong picks. 70 seconds of downtime for Marana bleeds into a potential Roche respawn timer in the next minute and change. So now, actually, they're going to push with the 60 seconds. I don't blame them. They could take the racks. It's not over, as they still have two outer, li uh, outer lying tier twos. Uh, to their name. So Ehug not quite out. Even if they do forfeit this Rax, if they forfeit five deaths, they are certainly out of the game. I, I Maybe this is a potential forfeit of a Rax. I, it might be worth it to oh, if your Marana can't to. buy. I don't think they can manage to fight this. If they lose heroes here, it's done. And Ryu is jumping into that. And he gets picked off immediately. There's no way out for him. <sighs> I think if he just waited the 45 seconds, it would have been fine. 3 2 1 does go down, though. Uh, so a little bit of bite back. Shanks is getting in on the action. Gonna go for a Pandago. He's all alone, so there's no escape for him. Fires off his ultimate, and they're scared. They do back up, but the A ult is on him, so he is gonna just burst there. GG is called. I, oh, God, I have to agree with you entirely, Ever. I think you just let that Rax fall and have a fighting chance later on in the game, but there is no way you could fight that 4 versus 5. There is no way. You have an invoker, essentially, that can delay out the the tier the racks you have fortification you know you're not going to get thrown in maybe 40 seconds with an invoker on your side and of course invoker was all the way in the forefront trying to lay down damage and it seems like there was a divide in opinion and as a result e-hug goes down for game one top five taking a one nothing lead as we head into week three night number two of sivo it is an eight week tournament for five thousand dollars pro am of north america as well as some south american teams uh, for example for sweet revenge my name is ever joined alongside by prove attitude you can find us on twitter at sivo for the league c-e-v-o myself at ever x and prove the girl on the other end to the mic is at prove dota we're gonna get the lobby loaded up for a game two